Okay. Hi. Hey, how's it going? What's up? Um, yeah, I know. Just stay late. I told you guys I was back in Omaha visiting friends, family, all that good stuff. So back here today. Um, again, if the review does not come out on Sunday, it comes out on Monday. Today is Monday. Welcome to the review. I talk about, or at least mention every single game uh, that happened this past week. And this past week was a big week for college football, right? Because yeah, that's right. It was statement week, right? The last chance to make a statement before the first college football playoff poll comes out. And um, well, some teams made statements, others lacked statements that needed to be made. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get into all that. If you haven't done so already, like, comment, subscribe, do all that good stuff. You guys know the drill. Let's jump into it. Again, games on Thursday. And I made a mistake last week. Next week starts match and play. So tomorrow, you guys are going to get games. Mid, uh, the Mid-American Conference, of course, plays now on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, which is usually a lot of fun. Um, again, not really any huge games ever take place. It's just some fun football to watch. If you're feeling bored, highly encourage you guys to go watch it next week. But again, that's next week, right? Talking about what happened this week, looking at games that happened on Thursday. It was a pretty sloppy game uh, between South Florida and East Carolina. East Carolina ends up getting the 15-point win, but there were a lot of turnovers in this game for both teams. Um, but again, all in all, East Carolina's defense held up when it had to. Uh, offense played well. Again, the running backs for East Carolina didn't really get going in, in this game, but uh, they end up doing just enough to um, be able to get this win here. Again, win by 15. Um, Coastal Carolina coming off the loss here um, looked Pretty good in the game against Troy, but so did Troy. They rode Kamani Vidal, 22 carries, 142 yards, and a touchdown for the running back out of Troy. Uh, Colton Marshall, really good linebacker, had a good game as well, but uh, just not enough. Coastal Carolina able to outlast Troy, and um, we'll see what the playoff committee thinks about this team because, again, the rankings come out tomorrow. So we'll see what the committee thinks about this Coastal Carolina team. Um, do they have good opinions? But, like, I'm curious to see if Coastal Carolina is going to be ranked tomorrow. My expectation is probably not. Personally, I still have them ranked where. You're going to have to find out tomorrow. I'll talk more about top 25 later. Uh, but Coastal Carolina does get the win, uh, albeit it's only by seven. But this Troy team can be pretty feisty, can be pretty good. Um, but Coastal Carolina able to get the win. All right, moving in the games played on Friday now. Navy, um, th it was a not necessarily a huge win for Navy because again, Tulsa is not that great either. Um, but Navy had zero passes completed. And of course, Navy, a team that runs the triple option, you might think, well, yeah, duh, but that that's big. Cause Navy usually if they can win a game, it means that, or usually when they win a game, it means they've completed at least one pass. This is a rare occurrence for Navy. Now it's happened before for Navy, but again, this is one of the rare times where Navy does not have a completed pass yet they still win the game. Only 302 yards of total offense, of course. All of that was on the ground through the rushing attack. Uh, Navy able to get the win. All right, Nevada and UNLV. This one was never in question. Um, never really in question at all. Uh, and an easy win there for Nevada. Again, UNLV, you get the feeling like they're going to win a game at some point. I don't think anyone thought it was going to be this game. I sure, is, uh, I sure didn't think it was going to be this game either. Nevada wins by 31. All right, moving into statement Saturday. Again, a lot of big games took place on Saturday. The first game on the board was not one of them. Louisiana, again, interested to see what the committee thinks about this team. So I'm curious, what is, how does the committee evaluate the Sun Belt, right? I think the Sun Belt's a pretty, pretty good uh, conference. Um, not one of the better conferences, period, but one of the better group of five conferences for sure. How are they going to value Louisiana and Coastal Carolina? Louisiana hasn't played their best this year. Of course, their only losses to Texas, Coastal Carolina has played pretty good. Of course, only lost to App State. Louisiana crushes Texas State here. No problem there. But um, Louisiana starting to get back to where we thought they were going to be at the beginning of the season, right? Cincinnati needed to make a statement win, and they didn't get it. You, you may say, well they, well, they won by 19. Yeah, they were favored by four touchdowns, so they didn't even beat the spread. And when you look, they did struggle with Tulane for a majority of that game, uh, pulling away here uh, towards the end uh, for Cincinnati. So I thought Ritter had an okay day. I thought Ford had an okay day. Uh, again, Cincinnati just kind of had an okay day, right? Again, 
making a top 25 right now, I think is as hard as it's ever been. And I encourage you guys right now, literally as, as you're listening to me review games, write down your top 10, top 12, top 15 teams. It's hard, right? It, it, it is really, really hard. Um, my top 25 is coming out tomorrow. Again, I'll talk more about that later. Uh, but Cincinnati needed a statement, did not get it. I don't expect them to be at number two next week. Although the committee might surprise people and put them in number two, give them respect. But again, the committee's mind works differently than all of ours, right? Um, uh, I know a lot of people have had questions about Cincinnati number two. They remain number two in the AP poll this week. But again, will the poll that matters now have them at two? So Cincinnati needed a statement, didn't get it. We'll see what the committee does with them. Um, still should be a favorite to make the playoff, I would think, in my mind. But they got to start getting things turned around a little bit more, um, play some better football like they have earlier this season if they want to um, really get into the college football playoff. Rutgers in Illinois. Rutgers improves to 500 with a win here. Rutgers can still make a bowl game. Now, it's going to be hard for them to make a bowl game, but they still can make a bowl game in Illinois. Coming off of that nine overtime win against Penn State, team just looked tired. Just looked tired, gas, out of sorts. Rutgers able to get the nice win. Uh, Virginia Tech, Trey Turner had a really good performance here. Seven catches, 187 yards, and a touchdown for the Hokies as they beat the Yellow Jackets by nine to improve to 500. And now let's go to another game in the Big Ten. Iowa and Wisconsin. Now, this was not the game of the week in the Big Ten by a long shot. In fact, there were two other games that passed it, one of which we're going to talk about very soon and one of which we're going to talk about later. But Iowa, man, Iowa has just collapsed, haven't they, right? Iowa's collapse has been remarkable. So, again, coming in, their defense has played really well, forcing a lot of turnovers, right? When you go back and look at the game against Purdue, there was a minor, like, you know, bump in the road. But I think people expected Iowa to get back on track this week. No. Uh, Spencer Petrus did not have a good day, was 9 of 19 for only 93 yards, ended up putting Alex Padilla in, did, uh, Iowa, the, did Iowa, excuse me, 3 and 6, or 3, 4, 6, 39 yards. Not great. While Wisconsin, on the other hand, Graham Mertz, 11 of 22, 104 yards and one touchdown, along with only three carries for two yards, but two of those carries were for touchdowns. And again, big difference on the scoreboard when you look at the score, but Iowa, three turnovers. And while Petrus or Padilla didn't throw a pick, three fumbles set Wisconsin up nicely to go down and score. Again, this was a fairly defensive game, but Iowa was outscored 159 to 200, or not outscored, man, that, that that would have been a huge score, right? Um, outgained yardage-wise, 156 to 270 total yards. So again, not a lot of yards for either team, but still outgained. Purdue even uh, outgained them. Now, I know Iowa, not a stranger to being outgained this year. In fact, I'm pretty sure they've been outgained by almost every opponent they've played. But now with this loss, the Big Ten West is back to being wide open. Minnesota leads the standings right now. In fact, we're going to get to Minnesota later. Um, they also played this week. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Big Ten West, wide open. I mean wide open. See, see who wins the Big Ten West, I guess, right? Uh, Baylor has a come-from-behind win. Uh, oh, but, again, um, Iowa's collapsed. Just this team does not have an offense capable of – making a run the the defense is championship worthy the offense not so much and even their defense struggled against wisconsin in that game anyways just had a little bit more to say about that now we'll talk about baylor baylor had a come from behind win against texas so casey thompson thought had a good day 280 yards two touchdowns and a pick while jerry bohannon on the other side did not have a great day only 222 yards no touchdowns and two interceptions Five carries for 27 yards and a touchdown on the ground for him. But again, through the air, not a great day for him. You know who it was a great day for? Abram Smith. 20, 20, uh, 20 carries, 113 yards and a touchdown um, for Abram Smith. And this Baylor defense held uh, when it needed to, right? Um, really did hold together when it uh, needed to, especially down the stretch. Texas found themselves up at the half. Baylor fought back in the second half, able to win here by seven. Some other stats, again, Baylor's defense, 
they were able to keep Bijan Robinson in check. 17 carries for only 43 yards did get in to the end zone. Um, but again, only 43 yards for arguably the best running back in the nation. That's really good for the Baylor defense. And then Xavier Worthy, good day for him as well um, uh, for uh, a losing effort. Four catches for 115 yards and a touchdown. Um, While on the other side for wide receivers, you have R.J. Sneed, who they did put the backup quarterback in uh, for Baylor, had eight carries, 90, had eight catches, excuse me, 94 yards and one receiving touchdown for him after they put the backup in. uh, And Baylor a come from behind one. So they improved to seven and one. Now they're only lost to Oklahoma state. Um, Baylor still has to play Oklahoma as does Oklahoma state. Um, so the big 12 race, I don't think is done, but Oklahoma is starting to look good, right? We'll talk about them later. Moving on though, Maryland is able to outlast Indiana. There were some really good performances here. Um, Indiana played McCauley for the entire game, 242 yards and two touchdowns. Uh, his favorite target, the tight end, Peyton Hender shot six catches, 106 yards and two touchdowns, while Stephen Carr ran 21 times for 136 yards and two touchdowns, all in a losing effort. There were no turnovers in this game. It was just defense stepping up when it had to. When you look at the Maryland side, Tug of Iloa, 419 yards, two touchdowns, and then Famato and Fleet Davis combined. This is the combined stats for Maryland. 37 carries, 84 yards, and three touchdowns, two of them to Famatau and one to Fleet Davis. Um, but Carlos Carrier, uh, Carlos Carrier for Maryland had a fantastic day. In fact, these are all career highs that I'm about to list off. Eight catches, 134 yards, two touchdowns. Great day for him. Great day for Maryland. They improved to five and three. And again, Indiana has been one of the more disappointing stories of the season. They have now fallen to two and six and probably won't even make a bowl game. So story to watch there at Indiana. What happens with that program? We'll see. Uh, Miami and Pitt. How about this Miami team, huh? Getting things turned around. Pulled off an upset last week against NC State. They're going to pull off another upset here against the Pittsburgh Panthers. Um, I expect Pittsburgh to still be ranked. They're still ranked in the AP poll. We'll see what the committee does with them. Um, But again, I think Pitt has been playing too well. Um, before this or they even played well in this game in a losing effort uh Kenny Pickett had 519 yards for three touchdowns two picks you could do without uh including a pick um that ended up sealing the game uh late in a Pittsburgh drive um but how about Trevor Van Dyke man that ever since Derek King has been out Van Dyke for Miami has played at a whole new level 426 yards three touchdowns and one pick again Miami lo- starting to look like the team that we thought they were going to be in the off season, right? They are able to pull off the upset against the Pittsburgh Panthers. A couple games I'm going to fly through here really quickly. Uh, Liberty beating UMass. There's no surprise there. So now Liberty improves to seven and two. Um, Believe they're going to get their bye week here in a couple of weeks, but Ole Miss is next week. That's an interesting game. We'll see what happens there in that one, but uh, Bowling Green and Buffalo again. Maction is happening next week. You see a lot of Mac teams on by. Again, to get prepared for Maction, I'm pretty sure Bowling Green Buffalo going on by next week. This was an offensive battle and a running back battle at that. Carry on Stewart for Bowling Green only had 11 carries, but 170 yards and two touchdowns, while Dylan McDuffie on the other end, 34 carries, 166 yards and two touchdowns. But you know what made the difference here? Bowling Green's defense. That's what made the difference. Six sacks, 11 tackles for loss, six passes defended as well. And Bowling Green able to beat Buffalo by 12. Again, some surprising results this season. Um, And let's go to the bottom game that I'm going to be talking about for a little bit because, uh, wow, this was a fantastic game from start to finish. Um, This was the game that I'm going to be honest, I ended up putting just on the big screen, like by itself. Usually I have two games on TV, four games on the computer. I had to put this one by itself because I, it was such a good game, right? It it was such a good game. So I dropped the game. I think it was Maryland and Indiana uh, was the game I ended up dropping, but to focus on this one, can you blame me? Like this game was fantastic um, and some great performances all around. So Cade McNamara, 383 yards, two touchdowns and one interception and McNamara was playing okay again made some mistakes in this game that definitely helped Michigan State 
get to or definitely help the scoreboard get to the result that it was. Um, and how about Andrew Anthony for Michigan, right? Coming into this game, did not have a career catch, had a career day in this one. Six catches, 155 yards, two touchdowns. It was his coming out party in this one. Um, and Michigan actually outgained Michigan State 552 to 395. That was the yardage difference in this game. Um, and when you look at stats from Peyton Thorne, it wasn't a great day for him either. Uh, only 196 yards, no touchdowns, and two interceptions. So you might be thinking, so hold on, why, why is the scoreboard looking like this? One man, two words, Kenneth Walker. Kenneth Walker needs to be in the Heisman conversation if he's not already. He needs to be up there with Matt Corral, Kenny Pickett, everyone else that's up there because, oh my goodness, Kenneth Walker, have yourself a year, have yourself a day. 23 carries, 197 yards. Get this, all five of Michigan State's touchdowns were scored by Kenneth Walker and including two two point conversions. Michigan State with a fantastic, fantastic defensive play. Um, a, uh, I believe freshman corner read the pass perfectly, was able to tip it, pick it off, and that sealed the game for Michigan State. So Michigan State, while I think, again, their passing attack still needs a little bit of work and getting more consistent, Michigan State has shown that with Kenneth Walker, with this defense being able to make plays, again, defense can have some improvements from this one as well as can the passing attack I've already mentioned, they can look like a real threat in the Big Ten. And now Ohio State and Michigan State might be the game to decide the Big Ten East. But again, Ohio State, Michigan, still got to look forward to that one as well. Penn State still has to play these two. Like the race for the Big Ten East is going to be very fun. And again, we'll get to the other game in the Big Ten East later. Um, but Michigan State, how about that? Um, they come out of the battle of undefeateds this week are able to survive, get the win. I'm interested to see how the committee evaluates both these teams because, in my opinion, both of them are going to be in the top 10 uh, on Tuesday, or at least should be, right? But where do they all fall? Again, make your top 25 list right now. It's hard, right? It's really, really hard um, with all, all the teams that we've seen kind of disappoint and get better, right? It's hard. Um, now, moving into the second column of games here, at the top of the list, we got Iowa State and West Virginia, and this was a pretty interesting game to watch as well. Um, Brees Hall, 24 carries, 167 yards in the touchdown. Pretty good day for him. Um, but on the other side for West Virginia, there were just a lot of great individual performances that, again, helped them get to this game, especially a name I'll mention later. But uh, uh, Jarrett Deggy, 370 yards, three touchdowns, two interceptions thrown. Uh, when you look at Letty Brown, 22 carries, 109 yards for two touchdowns. Bryce Ford, Wheaton, and Winston Wright. These are their combined stats. 12 catches, 206 yards, and three touchdowns. Two of them to Ford Wheaton, including an amazing toe-tapping touchdown catch. Superb catch, outstanding. Um, that was able to get that foot down. Uh, and West Virginia, going to pull off the upset here. Beat 22nd-ranked Iowa State, improved to 4-4. Four and four. Again, Iowa State's been one of those teams that's been disappointing this, this year as well. Right? Uh, but West Virginia, again, not the West Virginia team I thought they were going to be coming into this year, but a solid effort here in this one as they get the seven-point win. North Texas and Rice ended up going into overtime, and Rice, uh, or not Rice, North Texas. North Texas steals one here, a game-winning touchdown pass after they stop Rice on their uh, overtime possession, able to get the win. No, no nine overtime games this week. Thankfully, um, just that one overtime game, North Texas with the winner, second win of the year. Again, they have to win their last four games to make a bowl game. Going to be pretty hard for them to do. Also going to be hard for Rice to make a bowl game as well. Speaking of making a bowl game, Missouri definitely helped their cause in this one. A close one to Vanderbilt here in this one, but they end up getting it done. Tyler Beatty had a fantastic day for Missouri. 31 carries, 254 yards, and two touchdowns propelled Missouri to a win. They were in control for most of it. Vanderbilt made it interesting early, but Missouri is able to hold on for the nine-point win. Speaking of a great rushing performance, let's look at Sean Tucker at Syracuse. Syracuse defense only held Boston College to six points, but Sean Tucker, also one of the best running backs in the nation this year, 
26 carries, 207 yards, and one touchdown on the day. Syracuse with the 15-point win. They improved to 5-4. and four. And how about that? Syracuse is one win away from making a bowl game. A lot of people thinking this is going to be one of the worst teams in the ACC, including myself, uh, have emerged really well this year. One more win. One more win. And Syracuse fans, you've made a bowl game. App State has clinched a spot in a bowl game this week. They win 59-28 to 28 over ULM. Easy win there. As App State going back bowling. Uh, easy win here for Marshall. They're now one win away from bowl eligibility themselves. 38 to nothing, um, including... I, I believe 17 quarterback hurries. Crazy. Shuts them out. Um, I believe was one of the only shutouts this week uh, besides Louisiana, Texas State. I uh, believe was the only other shutout this week. And Marshall gets credit for it. Now one went away from bowl eligibility. And again, lots of teams just clinching bowl eligibility this week, right? We're starting to get to that point. Uh, Minnesota now bowl eligible with a win over Northwestern. And they have uh, loan control over the Big Ten West. Again, a wide open division. We all thought it was going to be a wide open division coming into this year. Minnesota stands alone in first place in the Big Ten West. 41-14 win over Northwestern. Um, Williams, though, um, uh, again, we already know Mo Ibrahim is out for the season. Now Williams is possibly going to be out for the season as well, but they have Irving and Thomas back there. Irving had 19 carries, 110 yards, two touchdowns, and Thomas had 21 carries for 106 yards. It seems like every time a running back gets hurt for Minnesota, they just have another one slide right up. Just, oh, Mo Ivan got hurt. Well, here, here's Williams. Oh, and now Williams is hurt. Here, here's that. And then even Trace and Potts being out as well. So they're into like their fourth, fifth running back. This running back group is really deep. Um, will it give Minnesota... Will it get Minnesota to Indianapolis? I don't know. Again, I think there are teams more talented than Minnesota in the Big Ten West, including Iowa, Wisconsin. Um, you could possibly throw Purdue in the mix as well. I think they're back in it. We'll talk about that game a little bit later. But um, Minnesota right now stands alone. Uh, Utah State, they clinched a bowl game spot this week with a 51-13 to win over Hawaii. And Georgia, number one team in the nation, remains undefeated, a 34-7 to win against the Florida Gators. Some stats here for you. Georgia was actually outgained offensively in this game. Florida did get 355 yards um, compared to Georgia's 354. So, again, felt like a really even game on paper when you look at the stats, but then when you look at turnovers, no. Georgia's defense, I've said in the past, is good enough to where they can beat you without forcing turnovers well, both teams had turnover problems in this game. Three turnovers for each team, one fumble and two interceptions. That was each team's uh, turnovers. Um, but Georgia, again, just a better team, better defensively, a little bit better offensively as they're coming to show as well. Um, Georgia's offense was forced to make some plays, again, not in like huge pressure situations or anything like that, but they were forced to make some plays. A lot of good chunk plays for Georgia in this game. Um, and Georgia, if you're making your top 25 right now, again, like I told you to do, because um, it's hard, Georgia should be the, the constant at number one. So that's the easy spot for the committee. Georgia's at number one. That's done. Filling out the rest is going to be the hard thing, right? Uh, TCU and Kansas State. Kansas State gets the 19-point win over TCU. It's not been looking great for TCU this year, and TCU uh, – agrees with that statement. They fired Gary Patterson today, like Monday. As I'm recording this video, he has been fired. He's been let go. He's gone. Uh, so an interim head coach uh, now for TCU. We'll see if the Horn Frogs can make it to a bowl game. My guess is going to be probably not, not out of the realm of possibility um, in Kansas State. Now one went away from bowl eligibility themselves. Um, both of these teams up here are also one went away from bowl eligibility. That's Washington State and Arizona State. Arizona State could have clinched the bowl spot with a win back in the Pac-12 South race, and now they've made it hard on themselves. Five turnovers for the Sun Devils in this game, including two interceptions, three fumbles, and Washington State scored 24 points off of those turnovers. So let's say Arizona State did not turn the football over at all. They win this game 21-10, but because they did, the game ended in a 34-21 win for Washington State, who also won one away from bowl eligibility. Really exciting. Um, 
times for Washington State. Again, I didn't think they were going to be that great this year. A lot of teams have proved me wrong um, in numerous ways this year. So we'll see what happens with both these teams later down the stretch. But now you'd have to think Utah, probably that team that's going to come out of the Pac-12 South, and we'll talk about that game later. Um, Oklahoma and Texas Tech. Oklahoma and Texas Tech. Caleb Williams did something that no Oklahoma quarterback has ever – well, I shouldn't say no Oklahoma quarterback's ever done, but no freshman Oklahoma quarterback. I believe he was the first freshman quarterback for Oklahoma to throw for six or more touchdowns in a game in which they started. So great great for Caleb Williams. Ever since coming in for Spencer Rattler, he's looked like a Heisman contender himself. There's been talks of, oh, well, Spencer Rattler's going to transfer and all these rumors are, rumors are out there. I haven't really seen anything damn like damning yet. I haven't seen like damning evidence to say, well, Spencer Rattler's gone. Like he's transferring. I'm sure he's thought about it. But again, if he stays, that just shows his commitment to say, hey, I'm, I'm going to support my guy. I, 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 I need to get better. Maybe he stays another year for the draft, but also they might end up giving the job. Again, this is very interesting, but Caleb Williams has been playing very well for Oklahoma as of late. Oklahoma starting to finally look like a contender. We'll see what happens with uh, Oklahoma on Tuesday and where they fall. Middle Tennessee able to beat Southern Miss. Again, the game never really in doubt. Uh, they improved to 500, two wins away from bowl eligibility. Um, and a team that has made it very hard on the, themselves now to make a bowl game is Nebraska. Okay, um, I have an opinion about this. And if you don't care for my opinion, well, I don't care. Um, I think Scott Frost needs to go. He's had numerous chances to prove himself. He's had numerous chances to turn this program around. And he's in year four or year three, if you don't count the COVID year, but it kind of happened. So I tend to count it. Um, but year four, right? He has his recruits, has his players, did pretty good in the transfer portal, minus the loss to Wandale Robinson, but brought in Samori uh, Torre. And I don't think the defense is the problem here for the Huskers. It's the offense. Look at the stat line for Adrian Martinez, two, 269 yards, two touchdowns. And that alone might make you say, well, well that's a decent day, right? Um, four interceptions. He was making some really poor throws. So uh, people might also be overreacting and say Scott Frost needs to leave. Maybe they give him one more year, but I don't know what you do if you're Nebraska at this point. I think at the very least, the offensive line coach needs to be gone after this year because that's been so inconsistent this year. And it's been inconsistent at times where they've needed the offensive line to step up. But Nebraska's had so many close games, but the Illinois game, the Oklahoma game, uh, the Michigan State game, the Michigan game, the Minnesota game, and now this game. Scott Frost cannot win close games, and it's proven. He's 5-18 and 18 in one possession games during his time at Nebraska. Something has got to change for this Nebraska program. For Purdue, you get a win. Now one win away from full eligibility. You put yourself back into the race for the Big Ten West, possibly make it to Indianapolis. Again, that's a wide-open division. But Nebraska's only taken themselves out of that race. And now, even if they want to get to a bowl game, they're going to have to pull off three miraculous upsets. Ohio State this week, then they get a bye because they played in week zero, um, then Wisconsin at Camp Randall, and then Iowa back in Lincoln. So chances of them winning even one of those by themselves are not great. Winning three of them to make it to a bowl game, unfathomable with the way this team is playing as late. Again, this team flipped the switch. They were playing really well a couple weeks ago, and now Minnesota happened. And then they go on by, and then they get this game against Purdue, which probably should have been a win for them and they don't capitalize on the opportunity. So we'll see what happens with Nebraska in the off season. If something changes some, maybe sometime later this week, sometime next week, I think that's going to be an interesting storyline to watch this off season, whether Scott Frost stays, whether he leaves personally, I, I think he's had his chances. He needs to leave. And at the very least, something needs to change personnel wise, roster wise, just Nebraska has got to change something if they want to get this thing turned around. But Purdue, one win away from bowl eligibility, gritty win there, uh, and let's move on. Florida State and Clemson. I've been on record kind of saying that I think the Clemson dynasty is dead. Not, not necessarily what I meant. I think this is one down year for Clemson. I think they're going to be back next year. I, I, 
I, I just don't know if it's going to be playoff back next year or not. Like I, I'm not quite sure on that, but this year, um, again, they're cardiac Clemson, right? They play these close games and they try to make their fans sweat off as much. They try to right? like F- Florida state has, was in this game the entire way through. Um, and Clemson again, comes away with a 10 point win, but that's because Florida state fourth and something right. Uh, fourth down they try a lateral play of course doesn't work actually ends up getting thrown over the head of I believe it was Jordan Travis but I can't remember um, and Clemson able to recover it return it to the end zone for a game ending and game ceiling touchdown which is what made your score 30 to 20 score is really 20 to 24 Um, but Clemson now one win away from bowl eligibility they and Florida State's three game win streak um, and Clemson one win away from bowl. El- Man, who, who thought Clemson would be one win away from bowl eligibility? Who thought Clemson would be five and three through what is it? Nine weeks. Definitely not me. And I don't think anyone really expected that, but um, uh, unless you're a psychic, in which case I would like to place all my money on what, you know, um, but Clemson able to get the win, another win that they have to grit out and uh, they end up getting it. Uh, Old dominion. Um, this, talk you you want to talk about grit uh, man I, i'm going to mention grit a lot in this video i apologize but again it's a football thing right old dominion uh lamarian james 100 had a 100 yard kick return touchdown before right before halftime that put old dominion in the lead this louisiana tech team is feisty they fought back they've tied it but old dominion drives down the field and nick rice the kicker a game winning 46 yard field goal as time expires now, both teams are two and six. Both teams need to win their last four in order to make a bowl game. And I don't think either of them do. Again, crazier things have happened. So we'll see. Uh, Wake Forest continues their unbeaten run eight and oh. Now are the 13th ranked Demon Deacons as they handle Duke easily. Easily able to handle the Duke Blue Devils. They get the nice win there. Um, again, I'm interested to see how committee evaluates Wake Forest, especially this week now too, right? We'll see what happens there. Wyoming and San Jose State. Nick Nash, uh, again, Nick Starkel, not playing right now. So Nick Nash is that guy, 150 yards through the air with one touchdown and on the ground, 11 carries for 112 yards and a touchdown. My opinion, he was the difference in this game. San Jose State is now five and four. And how about this collapse for Wyoming, right? They start off the season four and oh, one of the many uh, undefeated teams to do so. And now they've dropped their last four. So only making it harder on themselves to try to get to a bowl game. We'll see what happens with them down the road. And again, Oregon, I'm only going to highlight one performance from this Oregon game. And that was Anthony Brown, 307 yards for three touchdowns. He's starting to look like the quarterback that Oregon needs him to be. And overall, this Oregon team is starting to look like the team that beat Ohio State in week two. And this is another interesting storyline too. So where's the committee going to put Oregon? And mainly, are they going to be ahead or below of Ohio State, right? That is the big question on what where Oregon is going to be. Because if they put them ahead of Ohio State, Oregon does have that head-to-head win, in my opinion, up to this point. Doesn't have the greatest of resumes because, or doesn't have the uh, better resume because, again, losing to Stanford, Ohio State, We'll talk about them later, right? Um, and of course, with the loss to Oregon right now, may look like a bad loss later, but I, I think as of right now, still looks like a perfectly fine loss. I think at times it looked like a disappointing loss this year. And again, it was still a disappointing loss. Don't, don't get me wrong. But again, with the way that Oregon is playing, they're starting to get back to that form of, yeah, that's right. We beat uh, Ohio State because in years, or, or in, not years, in weeks prior, they um, have looked like, a team that just barely survived Ohio state when they dominated the Buckeyes in the horseshoe in Columbus, they're starting to get back to that rhythm. 52, 29, your final score. We'll see where the committee puts them interested. If it's going to be ahead or if it's going to be above or below the Ohio state Buckeyes third column of games here, the last column of games, actually uh, 18 more to go. I promise we're almost there. Western Kentucky able to beat Charlotte, a pretty easy win there for Western Kentucky. Both teams now four and four. Got to win two of their last four to make bowl games. 
Uh, South Alabama has really helped their cause this year. This has been a mild surprise to me. Um, 31 to 13 uh, is that final score as South Alabama um, able now one win away from making a bowl game. Uh, all right, Georgia State. I felt like Georgia Southern was the better team in this game. I did get to watch a little bit of it uh, towards the end, and I thought Georgia State, from what I watched, did play like the better team. On paper, they played like the better team as well, but Georgia State, nonetheless, comes away with a seven-point win. They improved to 500, now two games away from bowl eligibility. FAU and UTEP. UTEP has already clinched a spot in the bowl game, and that is already a huge win for this minor program. Albeit, this is a dis, this is a disappointing loss here. Um, but FAU able to capitalize off two interceptions from Hardison, um, and FAU is able to get the 28-25 win. Again, I don't predict every game and broadcast it out uh, to you guys, but again, I, I do go through every game and say, okay, I think this team is going to win. And I did think FAU had the slight advantage here in this game. But at times, UTEP played this game very well, uh, but FAU able to come out and get the win. Oklahoma State beats Kansas. What more do you want me to say about that one? Easy win. Uh, Cal beating Oregon State, a very good win for California. And you got to think this is disappointing for Oregon State, right? Oregon State had three turnovers, one fumble, two interceptions. Cal able to capitalize off, uh, off of most of those, and um, they get the 14-point win here. So. Uh, a nice win for Cal, Oregon State. You still only have to win one more game to make a bowl game. For Cal, you got to win three more. Um, so this was a step in the right direction for Cal. I thought it was a good win for Cal, but also a disappointing performance from Oregon State. You want to talk about disappointing performances? Let's look at Will Levis and Kentucky. Will Levis, 150 yards, one touchdown, and three interceptions to go along with one fumble for Kentucky. Kentucky was outgained 216 to 438, more than just a little over double uh, what Kentucky got did Mississippi State get. And how about Will Rogers? This was an incre incredible game for him. Only three incompletions was 36 of 39 for 344 yards, one touchdown, spread, uh, shared, shared the love with everyone in this game. And, um, Kentucky, while they've already clinched the bowl game, Mississippi State now one game away. So now Mississippi State has wins over Texas A&M and over Kentucky, and both of them were ranked at the time of Mississippi State winning those games, right? Mississippi State has some questionable losses on their schedule, yes, but all in all, I expect the committee to have this team ranked in the top 25. Do I have them ranked in my top 25? You're going to find out later, right? Um, you're going to find out tomorrow. Um, but Mississippi State ranked in the top 25. Heck yeah, dude. I absolutely think that they should be. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens with Mississippi State later down the road. Still got some games on the schedule that, again, might cause some Mississippi State fans to say, oh, I, dude, that's going to be a hard one to win. But Mississippi State has played very well at times this year. Um, was not a team I was high on coming into this year. But again, they've been one of the teams that have proved me wrong this year. And uh, they're at five and three. Uh, Ole Miss and Auburn, this was the game of the week in the SEC um, in terms of how it played out. But uh, Matt, Matt Corral did throw a pick today. That's now two for him on the year. Uh, 289 yards, no touchdowns, and, of course, the pick. Bo Nix had a solid game, 276 yards and a touchdown. But how about the performance from Tank Bigsby? Was running all over Ole Miss's defense. And, again, that's the problem that Ole Miss has on defense, right? 23 carries, 140 yards, and a touchdown. I've really liked this Auburn team because I think when they play well, they are a top 10 team. They played really well in this win here against Ole Miss. They took advantage of all the struggles that Ole Miss has, able to come away with an 11-point win, improve to 6-2, and two, again, clinching a spot in a bowl game. And how about this for a game, huh? SMU and Houston. This game was back and forth and back and forth. It went back and forth all night long until – Blake Mazza, 45-yard game-time field goal with 30 seconds left, and everyone in the stadium could smell overtime. The pungent aroma of overtime was just steaming. It was all in the air until Marcus Jones, 100-yard kick return touchdown with 17 seconds left, puts Houston up front by seven, 
play of the day in college football. Houston, able to get the win against SMU, pulls off the upset. The Mustangs are unbeaten no more. And I expect both of these teams to be ranked by the committee on Tuesday. Again, we'll see what happens. Tanner Mordecai still had a good day for SMU, 305 yards, three touchdowns, and one interception. While Toon uh, on, on the other side for SMU, 412 yards for four touchdowns. And three of those went to Nathaniel Dell. Really, really good performance from him. Have yourself a day, nine catches, 165 yards, and three touchdowns. And SMU, or excuse me, Houston, on the kick return touchdown, able to get the win there. A horrible storyline coming out of this USC game. They get the win. They ended up having to pull this one out as um, uh, Arizona made it close. But Drake London carted off the field, and he's going to miss the rest of the season with an ankle injury again. First round NFL pick surely in April. That hurts. That hurts USC for the rest of, uh, of the season. We'll see um, how USC plays without him for the rest of the year, but that's a huge blow. That is a huge blow. They're going to be m- missing him in a team that is still in that bowl game hunt, right? They're still trying to make it. Arizona's still looking for their first win of the year. Will they get it? That remains to be seen. Boise State beating Colorado State by nine. Um, a, a good win here for Boise State. It's a team that hasn't looked like a Boise State team for most of the year, but able to pull out that win there. Uh, NC State rides Devin Leary's 317-yard four-touchdown performance to a win over Louisville. Um, so now NC State, again, another team this week to clinch a spot in a bowl game. Uh, Notre Dame had already clinched a spot in a bowl game, and North Carolina, again, was looking for a statement win, a win to build some momentum. They don't get it here. Although Sam Howell did play really well, 341 yards, a touchdown and a pick, 18 carries, 91 yards for a touchdown, scrambling on the ground as well. But Josh Downs, again, being his favorite target, 10 catches for 142 yards. The touchdown pass was not thrown to him. Jack Cohn ended up being the primary starter in this one, 213 yards, one interception, or one, not one interception, one touchdown, no interceptions, and on the ground, three carries for 28 yards and a touchdown. But Kyron Williams, 22 carries, 199 yards, right, was that close to 200 yards for one touchdown as Notre Dame, an offensive explosion here in this one, Uh, 78 total points, but Notre Dame scores the majority of them, and that's all that matters, right? All you got to do to beat someone is score more points than them. Simple as that. That's what Notre Dame did in this one, 44 to 34. Um, Also forced uh, some turnovers out of North Carolina that did end up shutting North Carolina down. All right, Ohio State, Penn State, the other game in the Big Ten East that was going to be very interesting. Again, this game did not feel like it had as high of stakes coming into this week as it did the prior week before Penn State got beat by Illinois, but it still felt like a top 10 matchup, right? Ohio State got challenged, but we found out how good this Ohio State team really is. We also found out that it has work to do, right? The defense is still questionable at times why they didn't allow chunk plays to Penn State. They did allow some... Uh, a lot of third down conversions. Penn State, I believe, went 11 of 18 on third down. Not a great conversion rate for uh, the Ohio State defense. But speaking of the Ohio State defense, the play of the game in this one has to go to Jaron Cage, a 305-pound defensive lineman with a 57-yard fumble return touchdown. They ended up doing the math on his 40. He ran a 5.1. He ran a 5.140. That's the difference on the scoreboard. Ohio State beats Penn State by nine points. Sean Clifford, though, coming back, did not look great in uh, the game against Illinois. Looked good in this one. 361 yards, a touchdown, and an interception thrown by Clifford. C.J. Stroud had a pretty okay day, 305 yards and a touchdown. Travion Henderson, well, he, he was he was held uh, held in check in the first half. In the second half, really exploded. Final stat line, 28 carries, 152 yards, and a touchdown. Ohio State gets the nine-point win. Again, I expect both these teams to be ranked. Ohio State, obviously, but Penn State still expect to be in the rankings on Tuesday. We'll see where they place Ohio State among teams in the top 10, top 7. Where do they fall? Going to be interesting to watch. And again, if this this is how the Big Ten East race is going to play out, sign me up for all of it because I am all for it. November is going to be some fun, isn't it? 
All right, Utah looking like the team to beat in the Pac-12 South now as they beat UCLA 44 to 24. Uh, they ride Tavion Thomas's four touchdown, 160 yard performance. As now Utah stands alone at the top of the Pac-12 South with the loss, uh, or with Arizona State's loss. Uh, Washington able to beat Stanford. This is a big win for Washington here. Um, they're starting to get back on track. Two wins away from being bowl eligible. Oh my goodness, BYU. You thought that game last week between Wake Forest and Army had a lot of had a lot of offense? Well, yes, but also no. This game here had a lot of offense. Now, not as many points were scored, yes, but 734 yards of total offense for the BYU Cougars. Jaron Hall threw for 349 yards and three touchdowns while Tyler Algier 29 carries, 266 yards, five touchdowns for the running back from BYU. Uh, I, I do think Brennan Armstrong had a good day, 337 yards for four touchdowns, but two picks. Turnovers killed Virginia from staying in this game, along with 11 carries, 94 yards, and two touchdowns. But again, Tyler Algier, his five, for five touchdown performance, the story in this one as BYU, newly back into the rankings, should climb. Uh, again, did climb. I believe they're up to 17th in the AP poll. Where do they fall in the playoff poll? Interesting to watch. Uh, and then the last game uh, that I will be talking about, and it was the last game that went final over the weekend, was Fresno State and San Diego State. Jake Hayner, 306 yards, one touchdown. Jordan Mims, the running back, uh, 29 carries for 186 yards and two touchdowns. And when you look at Lucas Johnson, the quarterback for San Diego State, 22 or, excuse me, 220 yards, a touchdown, and two interceptions for him. Uh, as San Diego State, another unbeaten goes down this week. So a total of four undefeated teams went down this week. That leaves us with five undefeated teams left. Uh, but Fresno State, again, I had questions about what was San Diego State going to do as soon as they faced a good offense. And we got our answer. It was that they lost by 10 points. Let me switch sides. Hey, look, you can see my uh, microphone arm. Hey, look, isn't that cool? Look, I'm touching it. No. Uh, okay, so five undefeated teams left, as I just mentioned. You can see all the teams that were on bye week right up here. Um, and this is the note I wanted to talk about. So my top 25 videos are going to be moved to Tuesdays now to coincide with the release of the playoff rankings, right? I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do yet for that last week, the right championship weekend. I'll, you'll probably end up getting a twofer. You'll probably end up getting my review really, really early Sunday morning. Um, and then you'll get my top 25 as soon as the playoff rankings come out, uh, who I had in my top 20, or you'll probably get both of them really early. Not quite sure what I'll do there yet, but um, again, we'll find out. But my top 25 videos are going to be moved to Tuesdays now to coincide with the playoff rankings. I'm still going to compare them to the AP poll and the coaches poll, but again, the poll that matters is coming out tomorrow. So you're going to see the format be a little bit different for uh, the top 25 videos, but all in all, it's still going to be the same thing. It's still going to be my rankings. And now I'm just going to have an additional ranking to compare them to. And that being the ranking of the college football playoff committee. But otherwise guys, that is going to do it here for this video. I know these videos are long. And if for some miracle you happen to watch the entire thing, I salute you for that. Um, these videos are long, they're hard, but they're also pretty fun to record. Again, I love college football. I like talking about it, and I love hearing the feedback from you guys. So what did you think about games this week? Leave it in the comment section down below. If you want to support the channel, great. couple ways you can do that. You can like, comment, subscribe, share the videos, ring the bell, do anything you can think of, help support the channel. It really does mean a lot to me. Um, and with all of that stuff out of the way, I remind you to play hard, but tailgate harder. I will be seeing all of you guys tomorrow uh, with my personal top 25 and my reaction to the playoff committee's top 25. Goodbye.